breaking it. Love you. Love you. Staying alive. Staying alive. Staying alive. I could sing the offertory for you, but it might cause you to give less, so I won't. Uh, but uh, thanks for being here on a beautiful Sunday morning. It's raining outside, but the glory's raining inside. Well, aren't you glad that God's ruling, Jesus is reigning? How many know that He didn't call you to react and respond? He called you to rule and reign with Him. Come on, I believe right now the Lord doesn't want us to exchange religious ritual or exercise for kingdom relationship. He doesn't want us to confuse the two. I'm not here to fulfill my holy day of obligation. I'm here because I adore the King. And I want to be wherever the King is and I want to be among His people. Because where the King is, the Bible says where the word of the King is, there's power. When I want to be around where the word of the King is. Because where the word of the King is, there's power. Prophecy without presence, power without presence is just witchcraft. If you think you can do any of it on your own, you're deceived. On right now, the Lord is releasing purifying streams of prophetic and power throughout the church and the earth. The season of the entertaining evangelist and performing prophet are over. The Lord is raising up people who will walk in sonship, who will manifest kingdom. See, Jesus never said he'd build my ministry, but he did say he'd build his church. And when I'm a part of building what he's building, I know the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And I want to I wanna build what the gates of hell can't stand against. Well, right now, we're all invited to the table. There's a seat for you at the table. How many know God's throne is secure? It's never been in jeopardy. From before the foundation of the earth until the end of time, the, found, the foundation of His thrones are justice and mercy. The foundation of His thrones are secure. Sometimes I, I meet people and they're going through a hard time and they're like, well, God's still on the throne. It's never been in jeopardy. He's not still on the throne. He's on the throne. He's ruling. He's reigning. The enemy cannot usurp the authority of God's throne. He cannot usurp God's th authority at all. That's why he's always trying to usurp yours. Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth was given to me. That which I have, I give to you. You've been given all authority, all power. If that's true, why are there so many powerless Christians? He has given you authority over the works of the devil. He's given me that authority. How does it come? Relationship. The Lord is about to upgrade the connectivity of you between you and heaven. I know who I'm talking to tonight, this morning. God is upgrading your connectivity. There's some new fiber optics. There's a new frequency that God's releasing between you and Him. Come on, I feel like the Lord's anointing you for a direct line ministry today. Speaking directly to the Father. Some of you, some of you right now, come on. Some of you need to get the, the anointing of Taylor Swift and just shake it off. Shake off the, the, the fall blues. Shake off the, the rainy day. Patriots aren't playing until 435. Doesn't matter when the Giants play. Come back, Holy Spirit. Uh, I, I recognize I'm in the fall. I, I'm in the, I mean, I'm in the middle here. Uh, but I, I really believe the Lord is up to something in this place. Just, just hang out here for a moment. 
God didn't want you to have an emotional experience. God's emotional. I love the emotions of God. But sometimes we're moved by feelings. If I preach really loud and exciting message, I can get half this, I can get half this congregation standing on your feet, shouting at me, amen. And some of us could dance out of our weave. It would be unbelievable. <laughs> See, it's why I can only hang out with him for like two or three days. And then it's just too much in one place, so I have to move on. But if you have an emotional experience, it won't change anything. But if you have a divine encounter with the Spirit of Truth, when the Spirit of Truth comes, it reveals who He is, it changes how I think. See, some of you right now, you're about to get a whole new perspective. God is bringing kingdom perspective in preparation for what's to come. I feel like for the remainder of this year, God is aligning us, releasing kingdom perspective. He doesn't want to wait till 2020 to give you 2020 vision. He wants you to see where you're going. And some of you right now, you feel like you're trying to find your way in the dark. God's about to give you night vision. Daniel chapter 2, verse 9. And the secret was revealed. The answer was given to, to Daniel in a night vision. Don't translate. It doesn't translate as in a dream. He wasn't dreaming. He learned how to see in the dark. And some of you right now are about to see in the dark. You're, you're about to see through the dark place. You're about to see through the dark season. You're about to see through the depression. You're about to see through the doubt. You're, you're about to see through that thing that's trying to contain you. Are you hearing me today? Why? Because God's too good not to be seen. This is my de declaration every day. The Lord is good. And His mercy endures for all generations. For the Lord, He is good. And His mercy, His faithfulness, it endures for all generations. Some of you right now, God wants to reveal His goodness to you. Because unless you see His goodness, you won't, won't, you won't know what to do when the glory comes. I know the church is waiting for greater glory and greater glory rides on the wings of greater goodness. Oh, you're not hearing me this morning. The glory and the goodness of God go hand in hand. In Exodus 33 and 34, God calls Moses out of New England. I mean, I mean, God calls, calls Moses up the mountain. You get where I'm going. And he ends up in this conversation with the Lord and the Lord confronts him. See, what you don't confront becomes your culture. And the Lord said, why are you tolerating a mess down there, Moses? How come the people are acting this way? And Moses tries to turn it on God. It's the ancient trick from the garden. Did the Lord really say that? I think one of the original sins was doubting what God said and doubting His goodness. Because if I doubt His goodness, I think He's keeping something from me instead of something for me. That's really good teaching today, David. Thank you very much. If I don't know His goodness, I will think He's keeping things from me and not for me. The goodness of God. David said, my heart would have failed me for fear had I not believed that I would see. 
the goodness of God in the land of the living. So Moses is up the mountain. The Lord begins to confront him. And Moses goes into excuses. Well, you know, those people, your people, those stiff-necked people you gave to me. It, you gave them to me. They're your problem, not really my problem. Lord said, fine, I got a great, great idea. I'll wipe them all out. Well, well, what if you find a thousand righteous? Yeah, I'll, I'll stop it. How about a hundred? Yep, I'll, I'll do that. How about ten? Yep. How, how about one? What happens? Moses finds the goodness of God on the mountaintop. He finds the goodness of God in correction. He learned in that moment that correction was not rejection. For some of you, correction's been rejection. The Bible says that he chastises those he loves. The word chastisement there doesn't mean to push away. It actually means to draw close. Some of you felt like, if I do wrong, he's pushing me away. No, no, no. He's going to grab you, wrap you in his arms. He's going to draw you close. Because the closer you are to him, the less likely you're going to fall. Some day the Lord's pulling you into goodness. And he says, Lord, while I have you here, I'm now I'm paraphrasing. This is New International Day version. I'm paraphrasing with you. He said, Lord, show me your glory. And Lord said, Moses, nobody has seen my glory and lived. So hide your face in the cleft of the rock. And I'm going to cause my goodness to pass over you. And goodness passes over him. But what happens to Moses' face when he gets up? It's shining with glory. Because you'll never see the glory of God without the goodness of God. And you'll never know the goodness of God fully without the glory of God. Why? They both reveal his nature. One reveals his heart, the other reveals his hand and his heart and his face. I'm preaching today. Come on, right now. This is a these are moments, man. These aren't just Bible stories, you understand that? That's a pattern book. You want a book of Acts life, live live a, live a book of Acts life. Be, be willing to, to, to pick it up. Be, be willing to, to, to walk through it. I want some of you right now, the goodness of God is here for you today. He can't be mad at you because He's madly in love with you. He loves you too much to let you stay the same. There's a personal word for somebody. He loves me too much to let me stay the same. To let me stay where I am. I woke up the other day and I was in this deep sleep at like 2.30 in the morning. And I said, Lord, where am I? And he said, you're where I am. Some of you right now, you're trying to figure out where you are. You're trying to figure out where you are in life. You're trying to figure out where you are in the plan and scheme of things. You're trying to figure out where you are, trying to get your compass and your bearings. I hear him saying over you today, you're where I am. Why? He's present. He's the God who's present. I love the presence of God. Anybody else love the presence of God? 23 of you, that's amazing. Fun, right? I love the presence of God. I love the presence of God. Here's why I love the presence of God. Without the presence of God, I'm just dead. Still handsome, still humble, but dead. Unless He breathes on me, right? I've got nothing to say, I've got nothing to do. I, I can't move. But when He breathes on me, when He breathes in me, it changes everything. This is going to be a, a season where the, the wind and the breath of the Spirit of God begin to blow on you. Here's what I love about the presence. The presence of God is not a goosebump. The, 
presence of God isn't tears streaming down my face. It's not laughter. It's not rolling around on the floor. It's, it's not shaking. It's not gold dust. It's not a glory cloud. It's not a goosebump. It's not tongues. The presence of God is a person. And that person's name is Jesus. The presence of God is here. And when I say that, I don't mean something invisible. I mean that Jesus is here. Not an idea of Him, not a philosophy of Him, not a religious thought of Him, not a theology of Him. But Jesus is really here. I'm confident, I'm convinced, beyond a shadow of a doubt, Jesus is in the room this morning. Because I brought Him with me. Anybody else bring Jesus with you? It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's here. He comes on purpose, with purpose, for purpose. God is intentional. He comes on purpose. He wants to be here. That blows my mind. The God of the heavens, the God of heaven and earth wants to be with me. The Lord is healing the church of stepchild mentality. You're not his obligation. You're the love of his life. The Lord doesn't have any stepchildren. I love blended families. I have a blended family. My daughter is not my biological daughter, but when the day I married my wife, I said, honey, I'm never going to call you stepdaughter because there's never going to be a step between me and you. I love you like my own. It's important. You know, an adopted child has more rights than a natural born child. I have friends that have adopted babies and I've been with them in the courtroom where the judge says, before I declare this baby is yours and sign my name, put the seal of adoption, I need you to understand something. You can disown a natural child. You can write a natural child out of your will. But an adopted child can never have their inheritance denied. They have more rights. Want to know why? They're chosen. That's why the enemy wreaks havoc with religion. If I do this, I'll lose this. The Lord is breaking the line. The Lord is good. And his mercy endures forever. The mercy of the Lord is in this room today. Mercy is a way out of trouble, but it's also a way into promise. A couple of months ago, at the end of June, I was flying back to America from the Netherlands, and my jaw started getting puffy, and by the time I landed, it was hurting, so I sent an email to the doctor, to try, the, the dentist, to try to get in. And he got me in the next morning, I said, man, you got an abscess and it's been in there for a while, so now you have an infection. It's gone from the abscess has gone now into an infection in your jaw and you need four root canals. And so uh, I started, you know, we put me on antibiotics in the first round. After five days, I didn't feel any different. It actually, the pain grew worse. So I called the dentist, but he was, didn't call me right back. And so I went to an urgent care. And the, I walked in, there was a, a Polish immigrant doctor there, and uh, he took a look, he said, oh, he said, uh, in, in medicine teaches me, use steel to heal. So I can go in there and I can cut, or I can go in a needle and I, with a needle and I can, I can suck the infection out. He said, I just want you to know I've never done it before. <laughs> Suddenly the pain was greater than the process, right? It was just like, I choose pain over process.
because you don't, you're, you're not gifted in that area. And the dentist called me, he said, oh man, if he would have cut you open, that infection would have gotten your blood. You didn't feel any better, but that antibiotic was actually containing the infection. And he said, I'm going to give you an even more powerful antibiotic. You keep taking the one you have. And I'm going to give you another one on top of it. And so he gives it to me and, and the infection starts going down. And I go in and they, they, they do the root canal. And right about the time he was getting the last canal, the Novocaine wore off and he hit a nerve. I wish I could tell you I spoke in tongues, but it might have been French. I, I'm not sure. All I know is it hurt. And he, he said, man, he said, I, I can stop and, and, and numb you up again. It'll take about 30 minutes. Or I'm right there so I can keep on going. I don't know what came over me, but I just said, just keep on going. And so he finished it and I went home that day and, and I rested. And I'm sleeping on my couch. My, my family, I missed family vacation. They went ahead of me. And I'm laying on my couch and I'm, the Lord brings me into his presence. And that whether it's a dream or a vision, to me it was my, it was just life. It was just real to me. I find myself in the lap of Jesus and he's stroking my hair. And he's saying, that's it, son. I have you right where I want you. I love watching you sleep. I, I love watching you rest. He goes, there's no restoration without revelation. And restoration begins with rest. And he kissed me on the forehead. And then all of a sudden I was awakened because one of my great Danes came and licked me right on the face. Woke me up out of the amazing visitation. But I didn't forget the revelation I got when I was resting. Rev there is no restoration without a revelation. And restoration begins with rest. This is the 19th time I've preached since last Friday. I flew from Tennessee to Fargo, North Dakota, drove two hours to a church in the middle of the country, drove back to Fargo after four days of meetings, flew to Texas, preached for a few days, taught in, in a school, came back to the airport, two canceled flights, another delay, rerouted to Pennsylvania, missed the flight to Connection to Hartford, spent the night in a hotel, got here Friday morning, preached Friday night, yesterday to leaders, second time today. I'm not tired at all. Because y'all think I'm working, but I'm just resting. Because I got revelation. He said, I want to teach you how to rest while you run and run while you rest. Some of you right now, the Lord's going to teach you how to run while you rest and rest while you run. Why? He said, come unto me all who labor and are heavy laden. All who are burdened, heavy laden, I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If what you're doing is wearing you out, you need to check the yoke. What are you yoked up to? His yoke is easy, his burden is light. Here, here's what I'm saying to you. Many people stay stuck in gifting instead of stepping into calling. Samuel and Samson both had the same calling, Judge Israel. But they had different spiritual giftings. Samuel was prophetic insight, revelation. Samson's was supernatural strength. Samuel walked in both gifting and calling. Samson only discovered gifting. 
because his gifting wasn't surrounding his calling, that very thing that God used him to bless people is the very thing that killed him. My gifting will keep me caught up in your expectation. But my calling completes and fulfills the expectation of heaven. That is an amazing revelation, David. You should preach that somewhere. Yeah, it, it is not just talking about ministry. I'm talking about your life. There's grace for the place that he calls you to. There's grace for the place he calls you to. There's a new level of grace that he wants to bring to you. When I believe right now that the Lord's about to do something, I want to forewarn you that I'm about to step in an unusual message. It's going to be very vulnerable. I'm going to be very transparent. Some of you are going to become uneasy in what I'm sharing with you. And I think it's really important that we allow ourselves to become vulnerable and transparent. Because I think the Lord is calling us into, into an authenticity. The world is looking for authenticity. Authentic, genuine believers. Authentic, genuine ministry. Would you agree? Come on. There's no one like you. Because there's no one quite like you and him. And him and you. You just missed it. There's no one like you because there's nothing like God in you. You're a one of a kind. You're uniquely made. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139. You're priceless. You're worth it. I really believe the Lord is bringing us into a place where we can feel uncomfortable in his presence. I should never get so used to him that I become familiar with him. Because familiarity is not your friend when it comes to the supernatural. Don't be blinded by the familiar. I think sometimes we have a wrong view of the prophetic. We, we think it's all futuristic. I believe there's an element of, of, of the future in every prophetic word. But I also believe this, sometimes the, the prophetic actually brings us on a journey. It points us to a hope and a future, but it also sometimes brings us back, back to the future or back to that place, back to that place where we discover once again, our first love. We remember where he finds us, where we remember that, that very thing that he deposited on the inside of us brings us back sometimes even to some unhealed places so that he can make us whole so he can make us whole I've been on a little bit of a journey I've had a lot of loss I've, I've had a lot of things in my life that have been struggles and, and sometimes the people in ministry need the help the most I was in the Netherlands in, in June and I had an amazing opportunity to meet a couple named Chester and Betsy Kilstra. We had dinner and they said, hey, we just want to minister to you. I thought they were going to pray for me. And four hours later, I was in the fetal position, weeping as they began to help me process grief and hurt and disappointments and wrong view of myself, ungodly beliefs about me. And on this journey, I went with him, with them. The Lord showed me all of these pieces of my heart that I'd buried all over the, all over the place. So I buried a piece of my heart when I was six and my dad died. I buried a piece of my heart when my grandfather died. I buried a piece of my heart when my best friend died. I buried a piece of my heart when I got abused. I buried a piece of my heart when this relationship didn't work out. And, and it just all my life was in pieces. My heart was in pieces. 
And by the time I was done, they had taken all of these broken pieces. The Lord had taken all these broken pieces, put them in a treasure box, opened the box and said, son, I want to make your heart whole. And he put all the missing pieces back in. Which allows me to tell some testimony from a healed place. Because healed people heal people. Healed people heal people. You'll never have a greater sermon series than the story of your life. Than the miracle of mercy, the, the voyage of mercy you've been on. There'll never come a greater sermon I'll ever preach than my testimony. Because the goodness of God is on it. Because I know where he was when he found me and I'm not there anymore. See? I, I, I used to be a schizophrenic. I used to be an alcoholic. I used to be a pervert. I used to be an adulterer. I used to be promiscuous. I, I used to be an addict. I, I used to be all those things. Used to be. I'm not what I was. I have become who he said I would be. See, before the foundation of the earth, the Lord knew you, called you by name. Called you according to his purposes. He had the first word over your life. He'll have the last word over your life. And those two words are the bookends that cancel out every word that people thought about you and you even declared over you. Because he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He knows the plans that he has for me to give me a hope and a future. Are you hearing me today? A couple of well, many years ago, I was newly saved. My wife had gotten saved around the same time. We met each other. We were engaged. We had great zeal. But we didn't have character. We were sleeping together, doing things you shouldn't do before you get married. And um, I was kind of becoming a prophetic prodigy. I was working in the church. She was working in the preschool. And uh, a prophet came to town named Johnny Barham from Little Rock, Arkansas. Only guy I ever knew who stuttered in tongues. He'd go, uh, 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 Robeson, uh, 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 Robeson, uh, 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 Robeson, uh, and now, and now, and, and, and now my son saith God. And uh, so his first words to us were, and now, and now, and now, oh no, oh no, 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 no. And you never want prophecies to start out with, oh no. It wasn't in a public setting. We were just sitting with him. He goes, y'all, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Y'all been being bad. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Too many times to count. Y'all been being bad. Y'all need to break up or get married. And he starts giving my wife, who's now my wife, a word about her little girl who I, I just told you about. And he said, where's your daughter? I said, I don't have a daughter. He said, I said, where's your daughter? I said, I don't have a daughter. He said, where's your daughter? I said, I don't have a daughter. He said, yes, you do. And she wants you to know she's not mad at you. A child you'll never hold, he's holding. She didn't grow up on the earth, she grew up in heaven. Your daughter's in heaven, you have a daughter, she's in heaven, she's not mad at you. And the Lord brought so much healing that day. Because nobody knew it, not even my wife knew. She knew that I had been married before. I got married in August of 95, we were together for six months, and then married for a year and a half on paper, but really only together for about six months. She divorced me. I went crazy. I was schizophrenic and in and out of institutions. Ran into her after I got saved. I was saved for about a month or two. Ran into her in a piggly wiggly in the town we were living in. She saw me. She said, you know, when I divorced you, when I left you, 
I was pregnant. I aborted the baby because I didn't want anything to carry your blood or to remind me of you. And that tormented me. Tormented me because a father should be able to protect. And that day the Lord healed me of what I thought was the impardonable sin. It was the kindness of God. Well, David, that's Sunday morning. Why are you talking about this? It's time for the church to talk about what everybody's thinking about. We got to come off of our lofty mountains and our. I got a story. I've got five beautiful kids. I love being a dad more than anything else on the planet. My kids are my life. They're a gift and inheritance from heaven. I'm thankful I have two now waiting for me. You know what came off me was shame. See, guilt says you did something wrong. Shame says you are something wrong. You get rid of guilt by saying, Lord, forgive me. Because when forgiveness comes, guilt leaves. But when shame comes, shame wants to stay on you. Because if you see everything through shame, you'll see your circumstance and not see Him. And while goodness and glory are so important is because goodness and glory will, 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 will completely eradicate the shame. When I believe the Lord's restoring innocence, when He's restoring purity, when you are covered in God's presence, there is no shame. What did you put on today to come to church? I'm glad we all wore clothes. That's good. But we are, we are clothed in the presence of God. I want some of you right now, the Lord's changing your garments. Restoration and redemption has always been God's plan A. He knew that Adam and Eve would sin before he created them and he created them anyway. Because Jesus has always been the redeemer. How are you so convinced of that? If it weren't true, then the Bible would have never said that he was the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the earth. Because he wouldn't have had to be slain. The Lord knew I'd be a mess up. He didn't see me in the mess. He saw me standing here today on October 27th, 2019, declaring the word of the Lord to you. Anybody looking for gold can find dirt. But the prophetic causes to look past the dirt to find the gold. And we keep looking at everybody's dirt. But God's bringing forth the gold. If I were you, I'd start looking for the gold in the life of the person next to you. I'd look past the dirt of all this stuff and I would just begin to find the gold in them. Because that's what God, that's what the Lord is focused on. Come on, I believe right now that the Lord is coming to do something amazing. It's not how you start, but how you finish that counts. I didn't start so well, but I'm going to finish strong. The only way you lose is if you quit. Last time I looked around this room, I didn't see any quitters. Come on, the church is the, la is the world's last and only hope. Government can't fix society, the economy, poverty, broken families. Can't save the whales, can't save the environment. But you can shift the atmosphere. You can speak life. It's the church's finest and most important moment in history. 
word of the Lord over this house is you're a fortress for families. Prophetic outpost. Apostolic resource center. Equipping and training center. God's anointed you to bring healing to the broken, restoration to the hurting. And the Lord's bringing us into a place of new covenant. He's cutting covenant with us again. Let me ask you a question. Are you a contractual Christian or a covenant Christian? We've got to realize that the church doesn't exist for us, but we exist for the church. If I'm a contractual Christian, here's what I sign up for. I know what time it starts. I know what time it ends. They sing the songs I like. He preaches the messages that, I, that inspire me. I can get prayer if I want it. We can have a potluck every once in a while. And as long as I'm getting what I want, I keep on coming. See, contracts are based on distrust. When somebody does work at my house, we sign a contract. Because I don't really trust him to get the job done and he doesn't trust me to pay for it when it's done. So at least we have some legal recourse to go after each other. But a covenant's based on trust. Because he honors his word even above his name. I think that's why he can call himself the word. Because his word and his name line up. Just think about that for a moment. Come on, I believe that God is doing something in our hearts today. My wife and I went to a marriage conference two years ago, a year and a half ago in, in Oklahoma. Heard a guy by the name of Dr. Jimmy Evans. He said these words, if the grass looks greener on the other side of the fence, it's time to water your own lawn. And he was talking about marriage, but I think he's also talking about the church. If the church is missing something that you desire, don't get mad at the church. Fulfill the role. There's no restoration without a revelation. Well, aren't you thankful for the blood of Jesus today? As I close, I want to read the scripture to you. Second Samuel chapter 12 verse 15 to set it up for you David has let his eyes wander instead of going out to war he stayed at home and he lived in a day where kings went to war and because he, he was out of position his eyes lost perspective because his heart wasn't postured right he lost priorities because he wasn't leading he got led by lust. And his eyes fall on Bathsheba. And you can't tell me that it was by accident. Because he knew Uriah. He, he knew her husband. And he sent Uriah out to war. And knew his wife would be at home. And he knew where she bathed. She saw, he saw her and wanted her. And so he committed adultery with her and she got pregnant and covered up he killed Uriah he killed his friend there's a huge cover up that would make the stuff in American politics look like kindergarten and a prophet comes by the name of Nathan and he tells King David a parable there was a man who had a lot of lambs and another man who had one lamb. The man with a lot of lambs wasn't content to let the one man have one lamb. So he killed the man and took the lamb. And David said, who is he? Tell me and I'll kill him. And Nathan said, you're the man. I'll give this to David in the moment he was honest. Nathan said she's pregnant and because of your sin the baby's going to die. 
That's a heavy word. Because of my sin, someone died. This is where the story picks up. 2 Samuel 12, 15. Then Nathan departed to his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became ill. And David therefore pleaded with God for the child, and David fasted and went in, and lay all night on the ground. So the elders of the house arose and went to him to raise him up from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. And on the seventh day it came to pass that the child died, and the servants of David were afraid to tell him, that the child was dead, for they said, Indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him, he would not heed our voice. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He may do some harm to himself or to us. Then David saw his servants whispering, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said to his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He's dead. So David arose from the ground. You know what you do when you fail? You get up. The first way you overcome failure is you get up. You get out of the dirt, you get out of the wailing, you get out of all the stuff, and you stand up. And some of you right now, today's your day to get up. Today's your day to get up out of the mess. Today's your day to get up out of the past. Today's your day to get up out of that very thing that's tried to hold you back and define you. So David got up. got up from the ground, he washed himself. Some of you right now, God wants to bathe you, he wants to baptize you in forgiveness. See, some of you got up, but you still got the dirt on you. And the Lord's about to get rid of the devil's dirt. He's about to get rid of all the mud slinging. Politicians are good at it, right? Dig up dirt, throw it in your face. God looks past the dirt to find the gold. Time to wash yourself off. Get baptized again. Get baptized in the presence of God. Get baptized in the goodness of God. He washed himself and anointed himself. You mean you can anoint yourself? Absolutely. Here's why. The Lord already had anointed him. He laid the anointing down. If you feel like your call your gifting has just stopped midstream. Go to the last place of disobedience, repent, and put your anointing back on. He put the aroma of heaven back on. I think as soon as he did that, his servants go, oh, the king's back. David's back. He anointed himself. He got dressed. He changed his clothes. See, some of you are resurrected, but you still smell like death. It's time to take the grave clothes off. Time to take those things off that have, you've been wrapped in and change your clothes. Then he went into the house of the Lord and he worshiped. He stepped back into purpose. The season of punishment is over. And the season of purpose is back. The season of punishment is over. The Lord wants to heal your self-inflicted wounds. If you could pay for it by beating yourself up, he would never have to take the stripes on his back. You're welcome. Then he went to his own house. See, some of you need to come back to your table. Restoration's at the table. Sidebar, if I were you, I'd set an extra seat this Thanksgiving. I'd, I'd set an extra chair at the Christmas table. and Call it the prodigal's chair. 
Some prodigals are about to come back and sit in the seat you prepare. Went to his own house, and when he requested, they set, they set food before him, and he ate. Then his servant said to him, What is this you've done, David? You fasted and wept for the child while the child was alive, but when the child died, you arose and you ate food. And David said, While the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now that he's dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Don't mourn so much for the past that you never feast on his faithfulness in the future. Then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife. She's no longer Uriah's wife. She's no longer the harlot. She's no longer the adulteress. She's no longer the homewrecker. I used to dislike this story because I thought it was filled with meanness and judgment. But after I got healed, I started recognizing this story is filled with mercy. The Lord took that child so that the world couldn't point at him the rest of his life. He's the one that cost David the kingdom. That's the one. He's the problem. I found the mercy of God in it. I think if you read it enough and get mad enough, you might find the mercy of God in it too. You see it mad reading it. But I'm reading it from a healed place. Comforted Bathsheba, his wife. In other words, he chose her. She wasn't the sideshow. Won the late night booty call. And he went in and to her and lay with her. So she bore a son. And he called his name Solomon. And now the Lord loved him. I wonder who he was talking about he loved. I think, yeah, and the Lord loved him, meaning Solomon. But I, I think the Lord is refortifying something. And the Lord loved him. He loved David. And he sent word by the hand of Nathan the prophet who brought justice the last time, or judgment the last time. And instead, now he's coming with a word of blessing. So he called his name Jedediah because of the Lord. David picked a name. And then God connected another name to the name. Here's what Solomon means. Peace unbroken and whole because out of the brokenness came peace something that was unbroken and whole Jedediah meant the meant this beloved of Jehovah so he went from broken and mourning failing and flailing to an unbroken whole peace that was beloved of Jehovah one moment God changed the name many people believe that Solomon wrote this about his mother Proverbs 31 10 who can find a virtuous wife for her worth is far above rubies the heart of her husband safely trusts her so he will have no lack of gain she does him good and not evil all the days of her life. It says all these amazing things. I like what it says later on. It says she perceives her merchandise is good. In other words, she's saying, I'm not anybody's leftovers. I'm not anybody's second choice. 
Look at me, I'm fine, y'all. She perceives my merchandise is good. Come from a healed place. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders. She opens up her mouth with wisdom and, her t and the tongue of, is the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give to her the works of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Aren't you glad the Lord wrote, rewrote the story? Acts 13, 22, I'm closing. It says, He raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all of my will. God had the first word and he had the last word because he is the word. I want you to look over your shoulder. Look over your right shoulder. Now look over your left shoulder. What's following you? I used to think somebody's husband. I used to think somebody's boyfriend. I used to think somebody owed money to. I used to think. But since January 17, 1997, there's only been one thing following me. Goodness and mercy. The past can't catch up to me because as far as the east is from the west, so is he removed and separated my transgressions from me and remembers them no more. Funny stories are close. You're going to love it. In July of 2018, we moved from Pensacola, Florida to Franklin, Tennessee. I didn't know if I was really going to like it, so I held on to my Florida license. In January of 2019, I decided I wanted to make it official. And so I made an appointment with the DMV and brought in my mortgage statement, my water bill, my power bill, birth certificate, proof of residency, and my valid Florida license. It's supposed to be an easy transaction. They have proof of residency, your old license. They trade it out, take another picture, put it on their Tennessee license and give it right to you. So I handed it to the lady, said, good morning, y'all. That's how we talk down there. Like if you were where I lived this morning, you say, happy fall, y'all. Right? It's, it's how we talk, I reckon. And, and so we're there. And the lady entering my stuff looks a little concerned. So she calls a supervisor. He looks a little shocked. And he gets a state trooper there that is positioned, that's his assignment. And they said, we can't give you a license. And I said, why? They said, because you have a warrant for your arrest in Wisconsin. From, from June of 2000, or June of 1996. So a year and a half before I was saved. And, he, and they said, uh, I said, you're going to lock me up? And he said, no, they won't expedite you for this. It's $286, but you need to take care of it. And so I, they gave me the website. I got right on my phone. I paid it instantly. Warrant disappears. They said, we can't give you a license because you've been revoked in Wisconsin for 20 years. Or at that point, you know, 22 years. And, and, I, and I said, what do you mean? I have this valid license for, for 20 years one years they said well evidently they don't talk to Wisconsin but we talk to everybody and Wisconsin says you're revoked and I said why they said we can't tell you you need to find out so I call up the DMV in Wisconsin they said well you paid the fines for your two drunk drivings and you uh, did 10 days in jail uh, but you never did a drug and alcohol assessment and I said, do I have to come back there to do it? They said, no, but we have to approve of the provider. So I find the place they approve. And I go and I tell the guy the story, how the Lord set me free 22 years ago and set me free from mental illness, schizophrenia, and, and addiction, and alcohol. And, and the guy's crying, but he didn't feel too bad because he still takes my 300 bucks for the assessment. <laughs> and 
And I'm spending like three hours, I'm telling my testimony, the guy's just weeping like, I've never heard a story like this, gives me so much hope. He said, I, I hate to do this to you, but Wisconsin, I've worked with them a lot with different cases, and they're not just going to release your license because I send this evaluation. And even if they did, Tennessee wouldn't either because they're going to make you go to DUI school. So I'm sober 22 years, no stops, no tickets, no convictions, 22 years. So I sign up for DUI school. I fly my daughter to the Netherlands where she's doing a three month internship on Wednesday. Friday, I turn around and fly back, spend the night around JFK and then I fly home Saturday morning. And at noon, two of my sons are driving me to DUI school. And they won't even let me sit in the passenger seat. They're like, we both have licenses. You don't get in the back. My 19 and 17 year old. And they're driving me to DUI school and my 19 year old is, I love him, he's my favorite. You'll, you'll know why in a minute. My 17 year old, not so much. He's in the passenger seat. You'll know why in a minute. I love them both the same but different. One more, one no, no, they're, they're, they're both the same but different. And so they're driving me, and all of a sudden, my 19 year old starts crying. He says, Dad, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you for going through the process. You didn't have to do this. You could have just risked it. But you're going through the process. You're living out what you preached to me, Dad. I'm so proud of you. You're, you're a man of integrity. And Dad, you're going to go to that class. And the Lord's going to make you like the dad of the class. You're going to have words of knowledge, words of wisdom. You're going to lead so many people to the Lord. And I'm so proud of you, Dad. Now my son Caleb, he's a prophet. And he's going, my dad's a convict. I think he kind of liked it. He liked, you know, I think Born to be Wild was playing on the radio or something. You know, he's kind of like, you know, just, he's, he's giving it to me. Have fun at school. You know, bet you're gonna make a lot of friends on your first day of school. Then he goes, I think somebody from our new church is going to drive by right when you're walking through the banners and welcome to DUI school. Sure enough, I'm walking through the banners and I hear beep, 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 and it's the associate pastor driving by. So I walked in and I meet Jimmy. Jimmy's got a long gray ponytail. He's got prison jokes and dad jokes that last a lifetime. He said he'd been to prison too many times to count. He started counting on his fingers and he said, I can only count nine times because I'm missing this one, so that one don't count. Literally, he's missing a digit. He's like, you know, I've been there nine times. And so that's the kind of guy I'm dealing with. And he's like, I've been saved, boy. I've been, I've, been, I've, been, uh, I've been sober now 18 years. He said, I realized 18 years ago, I was allergic to alcohol. <laughs> Every time I drank it, I broke out in handcuffs. <laughs> And, and, and even I didn't laugh at that one. Like, the king of the bad dad jokes didn't, I didn't. And, and he said, always happens, boy, always catches up to you. And I just couldn't buy that. Couldn't buy that somehow my past caught up to me. Because last time I looked, my past wasn't there and my past wasn't here. Just goodness and mercy as always. So goodness and mercy followed me into DUI school. And I sit next to this kid. I said, what's your name, man? He said, Cameron. And I'm just getting myself settled. Will you be my friend and play with me at recess? I didn't. But the Lord said, tell him I believe in him, you believe in him, and he's not a screw up. So I had to weigh that out for a bit because I didn't know the Lord could talk like that. 
the Lord wouldn't leave me alone. He said, you tell him, I believe in him, you believe in him, and he's not a screw up. So I said, Cameron, I'm just sitting here and I need you to know something. God believes in you. I believe in you. And you need to know more than any other day in your life, you need to know this, you're not a screw up. And he starts weeping. And he said, David, you don't understand. When my mom told my dad she was pregnant with me, he said, this kid is going to screw up my life, but said worse. He said, I'm 24 years old, and in 24 years, my dad has never called me by my name. And he showed me a text thread. Every text began with, hey, screw it, but worse. Every day of his life, that's what his dad called him. And in one moment, God came and erased it. Cameron gave his life to the Lord, got healed of anxiety and depression and addiction. And that, that week, that weekend, the Saturday and Sunday, I had access to 26 people who wouldn't come to this church. Wouldn't come to my church, wouldn't come to any of my meetings. I got to sit around the smoking section and go outside on breaks. And, and I'll just talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Go hang out by the coffee pot, just minister to them one by one. That weekend, 26 people got words of knowledge. 26 people got a prophetic word. 26 people gave their life to the Lord. 26 people got healed or set free of something. When the class was over, I, I emailed the guy and I said, hey, I can't be there every month, but I'd like, I'd like to come as many times as I can. He said, will you pay for it? I said, yes. And, and, and this, this is what he said. What would happen if every pastor in Franklin would do that? So I've asked him if I could be the pastor of DUI school been back twice I'll go again next month because goodness and mercy are following me it wasn't humiliating it was healing it wasn't humiliating it was humbling and I'm telling you right now the very thing the enemy's trying to keep you ashamed of is the very thing that God wants to use to begin to minister to the community around you over time and I'm done almost. The Lord doesn't waste anything. I used to start my testimony like this. I wasted the first 26 years of my life. And the Lord all of a sudden, two years ago, stopped me and said, you can't say that anymore. Because I don't waste anything. What you call wasted, I call perfume. And the perfume of His presence is going to overshadow and overpower the pain of your past. There's a new aroma, a new anointing rising in the house today. You're no longer clothed in shame, you're clothed in presence. Goodness and mercy are following you, but it's time to get up. Some of you have been walling around in the pig pen, some of you walling around in the dirt. If I were you, I'd just stand up today get out of the dirt just rise up stand up out of the failure today failure is never final when the father's in the room i'm just telling you right now and something happens when i decide i'm going to get up maybe you got up but you need to wash off maybe you washed off but you need to stop trying to avoid the anointing on your life and let the lord anoint you again maybe some of you right now you need to change the old grave clothes and put on those those priestly clothes again because he's clothed you now with righteousness Maybe some of you just need to return to that purpose and start worshiping again. Maybe some of you need to go back in your own house and make it right. Stop eating the leftovers of the past. Start eating the fruitfulness, the fruit of His faithfulness for your future. Right now in this room, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, bow your heads. You're in this room, you never made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life. Or maybe you once did, you once walked with Him, but you find yourself away from God today. I don't want to embarrass you, I just want to pray for you. The Bible says all of sin fallen short of the glory of God. It means we all deserve to die and go to hell. But the good news is this, while we were yet sinners, Christ came and died for us. The book of Acts says, Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And there's no other name 
in heaven or earth by which a man can be saved other than the name of Jesus. Paul said, if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, Jesus is the Son of God, then you're children of God. Jesus took it a step further, said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. If you're away from God, you don't have a relationship with God today. I believe today is the day. Today is the day of salvation. He never told anybody to come back tomorrow.